Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to today's Mercedes-Benz Trucks Roundtable on Electromobility in association with motor transport. Um, first of all, as ever, some housekeeping uh, information for you. I don't need to tell you where the fire ex exits are, because hopefully you will know where they are, wherever you're watching this from. Um, just to let you know, there's been no uh, questions and answers to our panel today uh, due to technical issues. Um, but there will be a screen at the end of the presentation with an email address where you can send any questions you have direct to Mercedes-Benz and they will answer your questions individually. Um, the whole presentation is being recorded and again at the slide at the end will tell you where you can watch it again if you feel the urge. And all the slides which um, Uwe will be sharing will be available again so no need to take pictures of the screen as you're going along. Um, now, after quite a bit of a debate, um, I've been asked to recommend to uh, everyone watching, if they go to the top right of their screen, there is a little view button. And if you select side by side speaker um, during the presentation, that is the best way to watch the presentation. So I hope I haven't forgotten anything there. Uh, so we can uh, crack on. Um, I'm really pleased to have this event to talk about electromobility. Um, I believe that the, the change of the move from reliance on fossil fuels to power trucks and vans to renewable fuels is going to be the biggest change facing this industry, probably since the invention of the diesel engine 130 years ago. Um, we've known about climate change for quite a long time, well over 30 years, but it seems all of a sudden there's a big panic and uh, we have to do something about carbon emissions. And the UK government, along with everyone else, has woken up to the urgency of the situation. And now we only have 30 more years. After 130 years of developing the diesel to the point where it is, we have 30 years to wean ourselves off it. Uh, by 2050, the UK has uh, set itself a target of net zero emissions. What that quite means is still quite uh, vague in my view, but we are going to have to wean ourselves off fossil diesel. I think that's pretty clear. Um, now, on the road to that 2050 deadline, there are going to be some other huge milestones. By 2030, there will be no more diesel vans. Um, and many of the truck manufacturers, including Mercedes-Benz, have pl 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 pledged to go carbon neutral by 2039, which is not far off at all in the buying cycles. So there's no doubt about it. One way or another, electromobility is going to play a huge role in road freight transport in the next 20 years or so. Uh, now, Mercedes-Benz, which is obviously part of Daimler, as you know, is going to play a huge role in leading this transformation. They're one of the biggest vehicle manufacturers out there, and uh, I think it's, it's really useful to hear their strategy on how they're going to decarbonize. Uh, now, we're going to hear about their uh, decarbonization strategy from Professor Dr. Uwe Barker, Head of Product Engineering at Mercedes-Benz Trucks. And we're also going to be joined by a panel of pioneering operators. I was going to say that they're leading the charge towards decarbonisation, but that's a bit of a lame gag. But they're going to tell us a little bit more about their journey on the road to uh, fossil-free transport. So if the panellists wouldn't mind turning their cameras on now, I'll introduce them one by one. And we're going to be uh, have an hour debate with them um, after uh, Uwe's presentation. So thank you very much indeed to all our panellists. Um, I'll introduce them one by one. Uh, David Winchcombe. Head of Transport at DPD Group. Tony Stewart, Head of Logistics Operations Support at Hovis. Stuart Skingsley, Head of Fleet at Ascardo Group. Carl Hansen, Group Asset Director at Wincanton. And Paul Gray, who is Fleet Manager at Aberdeenshire Council. Very warm welcome to you gentlemen and thank you for taking the time to do this. So to get us going, I would first like to introduce um, Wolfgang Tyson, who is Managing Director of Mercedes-Benz Trucks UK, to set the scene and get us over on, underway. So over to you, Wolfgang. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for your very kind introduction into uh, today's round table. We are very excited about it. And uh, when, we, when we first talked about it two weeks or months ago, uh, we had the idea that for sure, uh, the discussion around e-mobility, about going CO2 neutral, is all over the place. And so we thought, why not uh, setting up a round table, a virtual round table, so we reach out to you, to Motor Transport, and thank you uh, for accepting us as, as your guests today. And <coughs> they decided on or asked a few of our customers to join us in a discussion round 
uh, which we are going to open in, in a few minutes, yeah, or in a few seconds. So very much excited about uh, to share today with you our viewpoint about our way forward as Mercedes-Benz trucks, not just in the UK, but overall. And there we found the perfect expert for sharing that strategy, those ideas with us. And yes. today I'm very honored that we have Professor Uwe Barke as head of product engineer Mercedes-Benz Trucks with us. He took some time out of his busy schedule in order to join us into today's round table discussion. And Uwe, I hope you are also a little bit excited. We are for sure yeah. excited what you are going to share with us. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to you, Uwe. Yeah, Wolfgang, very, thank you very much, of course. Uh, I'm excited and uh, very excited that you uh, invite me to this Mercedes-Benz uh, Trucks Customer Roundtable event where we discuss a little bit our future. And as Steve uh, introduced, yeah, it is a very, very exciting future we have uh, ahead of us. Uh, Steve, you said 2050 CO2 neutrality, uh, Great Britain. Uh, I will start a little bit uh, with our vision and our ambition uh, in, in a few minutes. But uh, you may imagine for the industry, for us as trucks industry, that is a major, major ambition to go for CO2 uh, neutrality on the one hand. On the other hand, us as engineers, for us, there is nothing more exciting than uh, technology and uh, ambition and challenges uh, ahead of us. And that leads me already a little bit to our ambition. And our ambition is not 2050. Our ambition is all of our new trucks in Europe will be CO2 neutral by 2039. And when I say all, then that is not a tractor trailer combination with a four by two. That is not a special dump truck or a construction truck. That means each and every truck out of, uh, out of our plants uh, in 2039 will be CO2 neutral for Europe. So with this in, in ambition, we come a little bit to the current status of uh, uh, technology, where we uh, where we are today, and uh, what what this slide shows you a little bit that the direct use of green energy offers the best energy efficiency. So what we all depend on is green energy, and the most efficient way is to produce green energy, supply it to the grid, and users store it a, a, away with only little transformation losses or other inefficiencies. So that is the first, the first row here, the direct use of the energy, and that is then provided by battery electric vehicles. The second one uh, here is a two-step approach, a little bit more energy losses on this way. Uh, at me, uh, that means getting hydrogen to the usage in our trucks. A little bit more inefficient than using battery electric uh, directly to the, uh, from the grid, but still a very, very efficient methodology. And then you see two other zero emission technologies, but with more efficiency or energy losses on their way to the truck. And that is the yellow one that is biomass and the biomass from organic waste is anyway limited. And uh, the cultivation of oil plants lead to the th so-called table tank conflict. That means uh, uh, we would then limit our cultivation areas and we uh, on that areas where we then produce few, we can't produce uh, uh, food any longer. So not really our way to go. And, and the, uh, the last one is then power to liquid or the so-called e-fuels, maybe a niche pro, uh, product, but uh, as less efficient as biomass without that table tank conflict here. And that leads me 
to our way uh, to go, bio, uh, biomass to liquid and uh, power to liquid, even being CO2 neutral, you see it on this slide here, they are much less efficient than battery electric and fuel cell using green uh, uh, energy or green hydrogen. So you see on the x-axis the kilowatt hours we need for 100 kilometers. And there you see you need much more kilowatt hours using uh, e-fuels or using biomass compared to using hydrogen or using battery electric. Even all of those uh, then CO2 neutral. The fossil fuels are efficient. Yes, they are, but they are not CO2 neutral and therefore uh, they will not be considered uh, uh, from us in the next 20 years. We have that, we will continue, but that is not in the focus uh, when we're discussing uh, on further, uh, further development. That leads me to this slide here and shows, okay, we have battery, we have hydrogen, and we have very limited, restricted, maybe for some winter service vehicles, whatever, our niche applications, we do have the e-fuels. Battery for planable, predictable routing, for less loading, uh, because the batteries already consume a lot of uh, uh, the loads, and uh, hydrogen for much more range, for flexible routing and changing uh, load. That is uh, why, we, why we are not on the one or the other side. We seeing those two technologies complementary. So we're going for both. And how we are doing that, I will show you in the next slide here. So we have a three-step approach when we do introducing such new technologies, including a complete transformation process inside engineering and inside the company as well. The first step is gaining awareness. And we did that with our urban e-track. First time we presented it 2016 on the IAA. That was the first prototype. We showed it to the customer. Uh, the prototype was ready to go. So it was running, but not really usable. That is more for gaining awareness, what to do, how we can use uh, electric, uh, uh, electricity within uh, or with our trucks. That was the first step. The next step then is gaining knowledge. And that we started beginning of 2018 with the first innovation fleet of e-driven vehicles called the e across Generation 1. I will come to that later. And then the next step is gaining business. And we are already in 21, so this year we'll already start the gaining business phase on the e actros side, meaning we will come with the E-Actros in series production this year. And then next year with the e -Econic as well. That is on the Mercedes-Benz brand side. And then when you see here, we have other brands. So we have Freightliner, we have Fuso from the Freightliner, for example. We have an innovation fleet on the vocational side with the EM2. And then on the extra heavy with the Class 8 uh, E-Cascadia, we do innovation fleets on the e Counter. Uh, with the Kanter 1.0, where we have roughly now 200 Kanters uh, uh, running uh, at customer side, and we will then come to the Kanter 2.1 in series beginning of 22. That is the whole picture of Daimler track. What we are doing today here as an intro for our discussion, concentrating ourselves more on the first row here, which is Mercedes-Benz. And... Uh, let me explain you a little bit more what we understand on innovation fleet and why innovation fleet is that important when it comes to complete new technologies like e-driven trucks or hydrogen driven trucks. So for us, really great story. The customers share their experience with us and we can improve our serious pro product after the uh, innovation fleet then with all this customer input. And for the customer, it's great because the customer, they can already try and use a new technology like an e in their environment, 
adapt their environment, see how that product works in their environment. And we get really positive uh, uh, input from the customers. And you see it here, attitude. We have two waves. So the first customers, uh, customers have to give their vehicle then to the next wave. And we heard from them, no, let's, let's, uh, we, we, we want to go on with this vehicle. We will not substitute it. And they really do see the advantages like image benefits, night delivery, and more. And uh, they like to drive it. And I can give you uh, input from my experience. It's fun driving it. That is not any longer uh, a headache, drive a heavy duty distribution truck. With this electri uh, uh, electrified truck, it is easy to handle. It is easy to go. It is easy to do business. And it is even CO2 neutral. Sure, there are open questions. There are questions, yeah, what is about the range? There are questions, is the power grid capacity sufficient to recharge my truck when I uh, run out of uh, uh, energy? There are even questions, uh, why I have a new truck here, it's electrified by, but there is no optical differentiation uh, uh, compared to the, to the other ones. So we heard everything here from our customers. And for us, it was important not only to have customers out of Germany, we had Switzerland, we had the Netherlands, we had Belgium. You may ask, why not Great Britain? Why not Spain? Why not Italy? Because we used countries close by to have our, we called it nurses, to have our nurses really close to the customer to support them during this uh, innovation phase. And uh, let's come a little bit to the technique. That is the technique of this generation one truck. So we have uh, 240 kilowatt hours battery capacity. And for an 18 ton vehicle, you roughly need 120 kilowatts per 100 kilometers, which leads you then easily to a range of 200 kilometer here for this first prototypes, a continuous power of 150, uh, 50, no, 170, sorry, kilowatts and charging power of 130. And the question now was, what's next? We have all that experience. We had all that discussions with the customer what we will have then in series from this year onwards. And the sad message is I can't, can't open uh, this curtain today here because we have an official world premiere in June 2021. And uh, I was asked by our communication uh, department to stick to that rule on the one hand. What comes next? from distribution to long distance. And long distance transportation means to us, uh, we have to base it and we will base it on two different technologies. Knowing that the one or the other competitor, competitor is doing it different, we think two technologies is important to have, that the customers have the full range of possibilities here, of zero emission possibilities. So we will come in 2024, why it's important to come in 2024, that we have in 2025 still a fleet running for our uh, uh, CO2 regulation and for our Vecto, which is pretty important to us. And the range of such a long haul distribution track will be around 500 kilometers. It will be a little bit more, but it will be limited because of the battery weight and especially the battery sizes here. The next technology will be then hydrogen. Told already, hydrogen is the next one. We will have it in series in the second half of this decade. So it contributes still to the CO2 uh, uh, legislation, uh, which, uh, which will uh, be 20, the, the 20, 30 target, 30% 30 less within our fleet at customer side compared to 2019. Um, 
Here we really will have, depends on the technology, and we'll show you the different technologies here as well. We really have more than 1,000 kilometers range, depends on uh, the hydrogen you, you take. With, with liquid hydrogen, more than 1,000 kilometers. And you see here, same story, customer innovation fleet starting already beginning of 2024. So beginning 2024, we will have them already on the roads. We will test infrastructure. We will get our customers on that track. And uh, that good experience we had from uh, the electrified Actros, we hopefully will have then from the hydrogen uh, Actros uh, as well. Uh, at least we get a lot of feedback and we use that feedback then for the final development phase uh, until uh, the second half uh, of the decade. The, the exact year I do not have. And the same story, it starts with gaining awareness. We did it end of last year presenting this hydrogen truck at, uh, in Berlin, discussing already in public, discussing with the politics because you need much infrastructure, you need that discussions beforehand. Then innovation fleet from 20, in 2024, and then second uh, half of the decade series. Why hydrogen? Uh, I said you already, uh, it, it really lower load, uh, faster refueling, uh, so higher payload, higher range, uh, to really to cover the complete portfolio our customers wanna, wanna uh, uh, need and wanna ask us, we need this technology uh, special for long haul uh, 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 long haul distribution. And uh, sure, we have our CO2 targets as we do not go compared to other competitors to bridging technologies, to gas, to hybrids. And we as we our ambition is going the the fastest way to CO2 neutrality, we need this technology anyway and uh, yeah, we will have it then uh, until 2030 on our highways, hopefully. So that is the track presented. It will be a different shape in 2024, but it will look different from that. What you see today, when you see an Actros, uh, that was presented. Uh, we have a payload of 25 tons, so it's not any longer the 22, you know, from uh, I mentioned for the BEF because you have the lighter system on board. Uh, we, we will sneak a little bit in the truck and you see here already uh, two stacks of fuel cell system. This fuel cell system comes out of our joint venture. We finalized in March this year together with Volvo, which called the uh, uh, Celtronic GmbH, uh, and out of Celtronic, uh, uh, we will get that few cells, uh, each stack 150 kilowatts, 200 cells. And uh, yeah, there we use now all our experience we gained over the past 20 to 30 years. When, when I joined Daimler, we had already a few cell research center in Naba. And so we have really, and, and you see my age, we have really a lot of uh, experience already uh, and this technology. And uh, yeah, that is then uh, the fuel cell position in the truck, more or less the position we have the um, engine today. And that are the tanks. Uh, we going and we striving for liquid hydrogen. We will have the possibility for gas as well, but our preference crystal clear is liquid because here we have the range we get 80 tons of hydrogen on board, uh, getting more than 1,000 kilometers uh, uh, range. But uh, to stay liquid, hydrogen needs minus 250 degrees Celsius. And for this minus 250 degrees Celsius, we do need some vacuum insulated tanks here, which is utmost technology today. We don't have it, but we have some suppliers. And with those suppliers, we are going to have that. I call it stainless steel thermos, thermocans. Some two major thermocans on the track will uh, be sufficient when you go for liquid. When you go for a gas, you need more tanks 
and that is not any longer stainless steel, that is then carbon fiber, because there is then the pressure you need. And to get more range out of gas, you need even to pressure it more. So what you today see in all the, those prototypes you see, uh, that is 350 bar or, or uh, 35 megapascal. You need the double to get more range here, but you won't get the range we have or we will see here uh, with uh, liquid hydrogen. We need a battery, but a smaller one that is a, a we have here a, a 70 kilowatt hours uh, battery for all the dynamic you need with your truck uh, because the fuel cell, you have to have the best lifetime of, of, of the fuel cell. You run the fuel cell in a more or less steady state. You, you will not change the power all the time. And then you, you breathe with a battery when it comes then to mountains or when you want to ultra pass other vehicles, whatever. So therefore the battery is an important part and even more important than battery and fuel cell is the management of both. The right management to get in the, in the right second energy out of the battery and then another second energy within the battery and combining that with a really uh, good driving performance. That is, and I will not go through each and every detail here, that is the, the back tower behind the cap where every technology uh, is in and all of those uh, components you may know from a normal track like an EAPU, we have here on a high voltage basis in. And finally, that's then the track. So that is like a track would look like from the inside with the tower, the tech tower behind the cap with a fuel cell where the engine is with an electrified axle and the tanks uh, aside. And that will then allow our customers the 25 ton distribution, long haul, more than 1000 kilometers uh, uh, range and so on. And uh, that is where we are working on. And uh, last slide from my side, uh, we'll show you that, that is not just PowerPoint. Here we are in the workshop, I had some other photos. Uh, also cancelled by communication. We have already first prototypes for sure. And uh, um, I'm already, uh, I'm already uh, uh, keen and very exciting to drive the first truck, which I didn't so far. That's from my side as, as a short input here, how we want to support our environment with the zero emission technology and uh, how we or what we want to offer to our customers on the zero emission side that then perfectly meets the requirement, uh, their requirements so that they will do their business and can do their business as they do it today, but with zero emission technology. Yeah, that is from my side, Wolfgang colleagues as, as a short input uh, for, for the Q&A and discussion round. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much indeed, Uwe. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, amazing. Just incredible. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the panel in a second to get their views and to ask you questions. But um, as the chairman, it's obviously my prerogative to, uh, to ask you the first question. Um, and it is looking at that the 800 volts of the DC batteries and the minus 253 degrees C hydrogen tanks. Is this going to mean the end of safe um, DIY maintenance for operators? Will you want operators lifting the cabs of these things and poking around with a, a mechanic who you haven't trained? Or will these vehicles have to go back to Mercedes Benz for repairs and maintenance? So far, what we are uh, planning here, yeah, in, in the first, the first, let me say, year or two introduction of these new vehicles, we have to train uh, all our um, all our uh, partners as well. So we will not do from one to the other year, we will not have 10,000 of those vehicles uh, um, in the environment. So what we are doing already, we starting 
in, uh, for example, uh, taking the, f uh, the fuel cell, we will start in, in uh, 2024. We will have roughly one, 100, let me put 100 customers. Don't nail me down if it's 120 or 80, but roughly 100 customers uh, driving those vehicles. Roddy, tell you, we will have our nurses around them. Sure, new technology, everything new. Uh, they knew they need our strong support. And out of that experience, then we will go ahead. We will see uh, uh, who else can do that support in future because uh, we will go ahead with our partners. But what we do see already um, at Mercedes, not only at engineering, in our workshops, we have to train our people and uh, our partners have to train their people. So the world in 10 years in truck business is not any longer the world we see today. You have all that high voltage. You need special trainings on high voltage. We need to train all our workshops, then the suppliers, then the, then the uh, maintenance workshops outside. Everyone has to be trained. And when it comes then to hydrogen, it is on the one or the other hand, even more complicated because you have all that high voltage in and you have fuel cells, hydrogen technology. We even do not know today if it is gone liquid hydrogen, what you have seen here, or if we go to high pressure hydrogen and high pressure hydrogen to handle is by far not easier than, than liquid hydrogen. So if you ask me today, it's easier, and what we discussed with Linda and other supplies, it's easier to fuel uh, the, uh, the minus 150 liquid compared to a 700 bar compressed. Yes, yes. Great, fantastic. Right, well, I'm going to go around the, uh, each of our panelists now and get a, a quick reaction. So if you wouldn't mind turning your cameras and mics on, please. Um, Carl from uh, Wing Canton, first of all, I know you've been using the e-canter for a while. Um, what, what did you make of that? And when do you think there's going to be a vehicle to suit every operation at Wing Canton? Bear in mind that most UK operators run six by twos and uh, most of the electric vehicles you see have got four by two. Um, what, what do you think of the, the future, Carl? Steve, that's, um, uh, if I can break that question down into a couple of parts. Um, the first question I'll answer is when do we think we'll um, have vehicles to fit every part of our operation? Um, that's, I really don't know. I wish I had a crystal ball because I get probably get asked that question every single day. So from my perspective, it was great to see the presentation today and see the fact that the, these guys are thinking about the future and what we need to have for the future. Um, genuinely, I, from my perspective, the technology is only part of that. Um, so the infrastructure is going to be really, really key for us to be able to actually operate these things as well. So and if I, that then allows me to circle back to your first question was around the seven and a half tons. Fabulous pieces of kit, um, really good reliability, um, deliver the job what we needed to do. The only challenge we faced was range. And again, it comes back to infrastructure. So, you know, the infrastructure just isn't out there at the moment for a commercial vehicle. Um, and the current way of thinking and operating in commercial vehicles doesn't work for us in our current sector. So we're not a parcel deliverer, so therefore we can't, we haven't got density. We have to travel quite some distance between drops and therefore we need the train, the range of a normal truck in order to deliver our operations as we deliver them and as our customers request them to deliver today. So, you know, the e-canter from a first version vehicle was brilliant it's just unfortunately we would have had to significantly change our model to get the best out of it and we struggled and we did you know absolutely struggle but that wasn't the vehicle's fault that was effectively the lack of infrastructure and effectively um, our ability to change our model in the short term and that's probably because we didn't have you know we we've got a hybrid operation at that point we weren't solely electric um, but yeah, look, I'm, I'm really, really keen to be able to try as many of these vehicles as we can get our hands on. It's the only way we learn. It's the only way we gain experience. And we've got a lot of learning to do and a lot of development to do, um, both across the industries that we operate the vehicles and the manufacturers who produce them. Because without these guys, we wouldn't have any options by to, to reach some of the targets that we've, we've all kind of putting our names to and where we need to get to in the future. I mean, what percentage of your operation is six by two double deck? And is that going to be a concern? Because if double it's decks a, are very it, efficient, but they need a big unit, don't they, to track, track them around? We do. So the vast majority of our vehicles are 44 ton 
and we need and pretty much all the time we need 44 ton so it was going to be one of my key questions to to the team was are we likely to see a 44 ton variant um probably from what i'm looking at on the pictures maybe on, on the hydrogen fuel cell possibly less so on the on the electric uh, truck but you know that i'd be keen to understand if that uh, is something that's on uh, the radar for the future get bearing in mind obviously that it might not be on the the immediate plans but to be really interesting to understand when we would like to see one of those and if it was at all um, being considered or whether it isn't at all because again it might be the case Let's put that to um, Uwe. I mean, UK operators, I know you and the continent think we're crazy over here because we're obsessed with six per twos, running double deckers. You don't have that on the continent. Will there be a, you know, a UK specific truck that will be capable of hauling a, a double deck trailer with a 25, 26 tonne on it? Yeah, uh, uh, first, first of all, sure, that has to come from the markets. What, what, what the markets do require and uh, we have then to see how we realize it from from uh, the payload point of view, what you said. So what we are doing here, distribution that ends by uh, 26 tons. What, what, what you've seen, what, what you've seen um, today in the first step, 26 tons, we will have already by the end of this year. That is the first, the, the first one. We will not have the 44 tons this year, but we will go for the 40 and 44 uh, uh, tons then uh, we, we still have not a, a six by four there in the plans, but six by two and, and a, a four by two. We will go for 40 and 44 tons with electrification and might be for this application. Hydrogen would be a, a good option and hydrogen from uh, 24 electrified and then second uh, um, um, uh, part of the decade uh, uh, hydrogen as well. So what we now need is what, what, what you said, what we need is input from the customers who is willing to go for what? Because uh, you, you may imagine each and every vari variant we have today in diesel to copy simply to electrified or to hydrogen wouldn't make any sense. So first of all, we have to see what are the most appropriate variants we should go for in the first step, second step, third step. In parallel, we have to see even if there would be a country and not with Great Britain now, if there would be any country telling us, oh, great, a, a customer, we want to go for a hydrogen liquid and the country is not willing to go for the infrastructure, it wouldn't make any sense. So therefore, this, this first starting period here now where we are going through the countries and where we see which technology in which country uh, uh, would be appropriate. And uh, that is what, what some of you uh, said in the beginning. For, for us, the major question now is uh, the infrastructure and how fast, and, and when we see the government on the one or the other, the government on the one or the other decision, it, it uh, uh, takes some time, but how fast we've we be to get the grid ready for electrified trucks and told you that is 10 times more energy a truck needs an 18 ton truck needs compared to a Volkswagen Golf. Yeah, so we have a 12 point whatever kilowatt hours for a Golf and a 120 for 100 kilometers for a 10, uh, 18 ton truck. So you need infrastructure for the trucks and coming then to hydrogen even more. But we are looking forward, as we defined as, a, as one of the major companies, there is no way in between. There is no bridging with fossils like gas. We go for zero emission. Uh, we are looking forward and we have good discussions with the um, government. We are looking forward to get an infrastructure ready to go for the plan I showed you uh, in the presentation. Fantastic. Okay, I'd like to turn to uh, David now from uh, DPD. And, um, actually, obviously, you're, you're a parcels company. You're very heavily dependent on three and a half tonners for the final mile. Um, but I've also been told that in terms of decarbonisation, the biggest wins uh, is line haul. Where, where is your priority at DPD in terms of electrification? Is it the trucks or is it the vans or both at the same time? Yes, yeah, Steve, I think... Um 
one of the things that we've learned is that um, you know, we're quite fortunate because of the way we operate our fleet. Rams has definitely taught us a great, a great sort of scope of how we can get electrification in, into our business. Um, and we will carry on with that van situation. Um, I mean, by the end of this year, we'll probably have around about 1,600 vans operating all around the UK. But it sort of brings into why did we take in Kenta, you know, back in 2018? Well, we saw that was the market that is very, uh, that, it, that will also open the doors for the line haul fleet. So realistically, I mean, I see that that is our next step. You know, we are always sort of looking at other alternative fuel sources, you know, CNG, etc. cetera. Um, but to get the electrification is really important. I suppose one of my key areas is that, um, that I have to consider is the, we operate our own uh, vehicle maintenance units and how would I support that and how would Mercedes Benz support that going forward um, is, a, is, a, is another concern. And then as we turn into that next part of the uh, century or so the next 10 years, when we're looking at um, fuel cells, that really then has a different scope on how I then manage my own VMUs. You might have lost. Oh no, you're back, David. Sorry, you, you froze over for a second. Sorry, carry on. So, so, <laughs> so what I was sort of saying is, you know, like with our, with our with our um, infrastructure, etc. We have two concerns. You know, is is one is that um, yes, it suits our van operation, but the second part is when we invest into Lionel, we have to then in our Lionel fleet, we have to then look at that in a different um, different sphere altogether. Uh, and that's one of my biggest concerns as we start to move forward with hydrogen technology. Yes. Do you have a personal view on whether hydrogen or battery for your line haul? I mean, you're mainly four by two, but you do run double decks, don't you? So do you yeah. think you need more power than a battery can give you in the long term? I think with our operation, we could, we could cope with battery quite a lot, you know? I mean, I think it's um, very important that battery would be the way forward. I think hydrogen... The only part of hydrogen that really concerns me is what support and what the network going to be support for the infrastructure. Yes, I mean, it's interesting to see that Daimler is backing both hydrogen and battery because it, it will depend, I think, to a large extent on which way each country goes. If there's, you know, if the government gets behind hydrogen and, you know, starts moving buildings and the gas network over to hydrogen and there is a, a readily available supply of hydrogen for vehicles, that makes it a different kettle of fish if you're entirely dependent on your own resources, uh, you know, you, you'd like to think battery will be a lot easier technology to manage. I, I think with all of these, Steve, it's, it's about what the government can support us in. You know, we, we've seen the difficulties with just operating battery vans. Yes. So and we've had to have a different sort of uh, strategy to how we operate them. Yes. Um, and I think hydrogen is, is, is if we're going to go that way with Mercedes Benz, in the latter part of the, the years, you know, then we've got to be ensured that, you know, hydrogen fuel, um, hydrogen stations, uh, you know, it's a costly investment to us as well. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, I'd like to turn now to Tony uh, from Hovis. Um, again, you've been using the decanter. What, what is your priority in terms of decarbonizing your fleet? Are you, are you largely rigid or do you know about this as well? You're looking forward to the Actros unit coming along. No, we have two primary operations. Well, we have a primary operation, which is our trunking fleet. And then we have our, our radio, our distribution fleet. So we do a lot of trunking into site and to, to major multiples. And then we do local deliveries with, I say local, they could be 100 miles away with a distribution fleet. So we're interested across the spectrum from sort of seven half ton to, to 38 ton. Yes. Um, at the moment, there's not that there's not too much or too many types of vehicle we can actually use i mean with the two e-canters we got are fantastic vehicles I, I, I need to say that drivers love driving them the, the biggest problem we have is the charging equipment to keep them charged yes plus the mileage so if you think we run say maybe 30 routes into london Literally, we struggle to find two routes we can use the canters on because of their mileage yes. or because of their range. 
if that range was to go up 30, 40, 50 percent, to make a massive difference to that mark of vehicle. So a priority for me on electric, because obviously we do a lot of inner, inner London deliveries, early hours in the morning. If we could have the canter with a bigger range, that would certainly allow us to introduce more of them into the fleet. But at the current range, we couldn't take any more than we do. Yes. Um, and when we look to the bigger vehicles, they're so far down the line for me, Steve, at this moment in time. It's a cloudy, it's a lot of cloudy waters, to be honest. Um, we've set ourselves as an industry a fantastic target to get to a place. Yes. But the technology is going to be complex. Um, the equipment is going to be complex. And the cost is going to be very high. So how we manage ourselves from now to then, I think if we had the same conversation in two years' time, it could be a different one because things would have evolved. And we'd have learned a lot more about all of this stuff. So for the future, I don't know what Hobbit's way forward is, except to say we're going to use the best of what's available as it, as it comes available into the various parts of our operation where we can put it. You will be Sorry, on mute. Steve. You're... Steve, you've been on mute for me, at least. Um, Steve, um, you, should, you should unmute your mic. <clears throat> Still on mute, Steve. Um, I think one thing that's really clear, guys, is um, if I look at Tony's operation, taking stuff from a bakery into central London, I look at Carl with his STEM mileage, and then you compare it to and, and DPD, but a central hub actually in uh, London and you're doing what 50 to 100 meters before you first it's very different in terms of its operation Thank yes. you Sam, and, for bridging and uh, I think uh, Steve are you back you have been yeah, uh, yeah, on the, mute I, I was muted by the house for some reason I didn't do it myself ah, I well, see I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, okay I'm back now um, yes, Good. thank you. Yeah, I was just going to uh, ask Tony uh, a follow-up question. As I said, you know, for hauliers, the upfront cost of these vehicles is very, very prohibitive. Uh, from an own account point of view, what would you like to see the government doing to help you make this transition? Because bus operators seem to get millions and millions and millions of pounds in subsidies to make this sort of transition, and yet the poor old freight operator doesn't get a great deal. Is, is there anything that central government or local government could do to help you with this transition? I think there is a massive gap here, Steve, between operators and central government and local government and local councils. Yes. Um, I have a, I don't want to diverse the conversation, but we, we run our vehicles on HVO, which we know saves 90% CO2 compared to diesel at the moment. Yes. But we get no recognition for that from any yes. government, any council. You know, we've saved 25,000 metric tonnes of CO2. But nobody, there, there is nowhere to take that. You know, I mention it to a council. To them, it doesn't mean anything. So I think there's a, there's a hell of a lot of education that needs to happen between us as an industry and government, local councils, authorities, call them what you like, because the gap is too big. And until we can sort of come together, we're at both ends, one and the same thing, but we don't seem to help each other on our way to get there. So. We do need the help, Steve. I can't tell you what that looks like, but it needs to come from government top down because we're pushing up from the bottom. And at the moment, we do seem to be so far apart. Yes. Sam, you just popped in there. I was trying to introduce you earlier on. Sam is the uh, UK sales director for Mercedes Benz. I mean, when you talk to customers, is the upfront cost of these vehicles the major barrier to their adoption when, it, when they become available? Or is it more things more like who's going to maintain them? Where can I recharge them? I don't think it's even got down to cost yet. Um, I think, as the guys say, it's mainly about the infrastructure, yeah. but it's also about um, how are they going to operate their fleet? What do they need from it? Um, being very specific about what routes they use, first of all, on electrification to get their heads around it. If you go back to as far as sort of 2008, um, and we did some uh, hybrid trials uh, in London uh, with Cantus. Soon found that um, whilst we were saving 30% on fuel with a hybrid, um, you were only doing 12 miles a day. The on cost of the actual um, technology against your 12 to 18 miles a day was quite stark. So we know that with, um, with David and the team at DPD, 
Um, they were saving a huge amount of, of, in terms of percentages. Um, but the reality was that at £7,000 additional for the price of the technology on the vehicle, it didn't quite work. So there needs to be incentives to, to help uh, these guys uh, in government. And one, one thought I was thinking was um, all on the, on the line from Aberdeenshire Council. See, um, Scot the Scottish um, government is slightly different to the uh, English government, and so there are different steers there. But I'd be really interested to hear if, uh, as a council, he has support from his local government and the local council for operating electric vehicles in the future. That would be that would really intrigue me. Yeah, thank, thank you, Sam. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully supported by the local councillors um, and colleagues alike throughout Aberdeenshire in the decarbonisation of our fleet. You're right in pointing out the Scottish Government approach is slightly different. We're working to different timescales uh, to the rest of the UK. So by 2025, uh, we're looking to remove the need to purchase any new petrol or diesel commercial, light commercial vehicle by 2025 um, and by 2030 any commercial vehicle, petrol or diesel by 2030. So our time scales are slightly tighter than the rest of the UK. Saying that though, I'm pleased to, pleased to see the, the innovation and development that Mercedes are, are, are bringing forward. That's, that's going to be very key for us to, to achieve that, both on the battery technology and the hydrogen technology. Um, we're, we're fortunate we have got a hydrogen fueling station close by to us that we can tap into. It's not ours, but it, it is there. Um, I have already got some small hydrogen vehicles uh, running about. Um, but. The, the type of vehicle we operate as a council uh, is varied, vast and varied from small light commercial vans right the way up to the 32 ton rigids. Um, split, my, my fleet is probably split about 70, 30 light commercial to heavies. Um, and at the moment only running five, 6% as zero emission. So a lot of challenges ahead, exactly as, as colleagues have already said on the call here today, infrastructure. So looking at charging infrastructure the right way across our depots, home charging for our colleagues that take vehicles home. Maintenance, we do all our maintenance in house ourselves. So again, how do we prep for that? Um, so interesting to hear what they were saying about the, the hydrogen technology going forward uh, and what would be needed for that. I mean, it's interesting. I went to visit the, the Aberdeen um, BRC hydrogen station. It's it's quite a complicated bit of kit. It's uh, it's a bit of a chemistry set bubbling away there um, in the city. I mean, would you be, be prepared to invest in hydrogen vehicles? Because security of supply must be a concern because that, that station could close tomorrow if there's no demand. So are you worried about spending money on, on uh, stranded assets that you, if hydrogen did disappear as a source of fuel, vehicles which you couldn't use. Is that a concern for you? I, I wouldn't say it's really a concern, Steve. It's something we're building into our strategy that hydrogen will form part of our solution for a zero emission fleet going forward. Um, you know, out, out of all our vehicles, we've got vehicles that are operating 24 seven. We've got heavy goods vehicles that are out from you know early hours in the morning, like our gritting fleet. So they have to be able to operate. We cannot say to the public, sorry, we can't grip the road because we've got to stick the, the truck on charge for five hours. That just isn't an option. So we need, we need that flexibility, that usability that hydrogen will give us. And I see that as part of the part of our strategy going forward in, in, in decarbonizing the fleet. So part of looking at our own infrastructure, and this is where as a local authority, <laughs> The difficult decision is whether we rely on our own infrastructure or whether we get that private uh, investment into the into the Aberdeenshire area to support it. Great. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, Stuart now from Ocado. Um, Ocado, it's taken what some people might regard as an intermediate step and, and gone for some natural gas vehicles. Do you see that as a long-term viable option or is it, as I say, a stepping stone to electric vehicles? It's absolutely a stepping stone. Um, we found out today the technology is 
is some way down the road. And I think as a business, we needed, we felt the need to do something now. Our ambitions are ahead of the rest of the legislation in terms of being carbon neutral. Um, so I guess we take the view that whatever we can do today, we should do. So the use of HVO is something we're considering. So interesting that Tony's already been down that path. Uh, the CNG, yeah, it does. It's a it's a capable product today, and it's enabling us to to make that transition. But yeah, we're certainly interested to see what the guys in Germany are doing with electrification and hydrogen moving on. Um, I've just been sitting here listening to everybody, and I, we've all we've all got the same points really. But I'd kind of put mine down to government, uh, accountants, and self help. <laughs> a bit basic, but the government lobbying at the moment we we just, we're just following a line of legislation that's been around for years and, and this is a radical change yeah. in our history we need radical change yeah. in the way legislation is put forward and controlled and, and changed um, obviously accountants need to be um, appeased um, so we've got to keep one eye on the cost because you've got to make a viable business but I think you know it is kind of a helpless position we're in as, as fleet engineers and operators when you look at um, the advancement of technology. We run a lot of three and a half ton vans. It's a very limited offering of vehicles available at the moment. They're all they're all coming, but they're not there now. So the self-help bit comes from us with assuming that nobody can build a truck that's going to do 500 miles, and maybe look at the infrastructure, not just the power that goes to our sites, but the location of the sites. Maybe more <coughs> sites nearer to our customers, so we can we can fit what the industry is able to supply and then obviously develop it as it goes. Uh, the other compromises, I think a challenge sometimes about the use of six feet. Um, we've got three of them on our fleet. Um, it's a perception in the UK you've got to have one. We've challenged it, we've challenged it ourselves um, to enable us to use CNG. And when you really challenge it and really delve deeply because you want to do something, it is it is doable. So, um, yeah, I, I guess from our perspective, um, we're keen to see what the manufacturers can do. But I guess the big one at the back of all of this, forgetting the technology, is the day-to-day the -day stuff. What are these things like to crash? What are they like to repair? And who maintains them? These are all real problems that we all have. Yes. And you see some of the technology, it makes me anxious because having a bump in one might be a concern. What, what, what have the guys in Germany got sort of to say to reassure us on that one? I think uh, I can also jump in here, uh, Wolfgang speaking. Um, as we have already uh, mentioned, um, we do not have thousands uh, of these trucks in the first years to come. So we are going into this new generation of E and of hybrid step by step. And with that, we will also learn uh, to place the first depots, which are then, let's say, trained in a proper way to maintain uh, these trucks uh, in, um, in a perfect and high quality way. We will have, a, let's say, a very selective choice and we, we choose the depot wisely, yeah, to, let's say, which are the customers who likes to go first, what are the area our customers going to operate in, yeah, and then for sure we have to sit down and to make them ready. Uh, thanks God, uh, some of our dealers are already on that journey due to e-counter, due to also our e-sprinters, knowing that high voltage, knowing that uh, uh, compressed gas uh, or liquid gas uh, or hydrogen will be another challenge yeah, for security central. I think about it's not just uh, our dealer partners, not just about the service, it's also about the bodies, right? Because also these trucks still need to see a bodybuilder. So also here, uh, we need to get into that exercise step by step. It will be a new excitement, undoubtedly, yeah. But we are not afraid. Uh, we are going to start that early. And uh, as our engineers are going to prepare themselves now, in the next years also we in the markets have our own teams now working uh, together with the network in order to ensure our readiness. Yes, fantastic. Well, Wolfgang, what we have to do together, uh, and that is really what we have to do together and uh, hearing what you, you guys said is, uh, um, we, we, we have a lot of loose ends today still. For, for engineering, it's quite difficult to uh, invent everything with all those loose ends. But, but, but we have to go in corporations. We started, we started already first one with Shell, 
with OMV, with Linda, to go for hydrogen standards. That would be one. The next one would be charging standards. We are in the ACR and in the VDA, we are working on charging standards that you really, when you come with your truck to a charging station, that, that you can be sure that your truck could be charged at that station as well. On charging standards, what, what will be the next five years, we will clear see megawatt charging here as well. So you will be much faster in charging your trucks on the, on the electric side, but you have to know where to find what and there comes another topic in which is valid for all our trucks from light to heavy duty, which is connectivity. So we have an onboard system where you do see how much to go, where to go to recharge, that you can feel safe when you're driving your truck and not uh, have to say, oh, will I make it or might I not? Imagine you've been there with your electric truck fully loaded or even not loaded and there is no charging available. So then comes this connected network in and the connect and your truck has to be connected to that network. So there is more to come. Therefore, much important is or, or very important for us to go in with this first fleets to see what the customer is needing. And that what I said, a lot of those topics come came out of the first customer fleet. So the customer is telling us and the colleague from DPD, we had a colleague from Hermes in the first fleet here as well to giving us input, uh, especially on on, uh, uh, on on those parcel uh, suppliers. And we need input and uh, it is not any longer this classic engineering what we had some years ago where we defined a truck and then eight years longer, we have the next facelift and another eight years, the another facelift. We are, we have to be very flexible and when tomorrow another charging standard or another hydrogen standard is there and it comes down to 700 bar, whatever, we have to react, we have to bring it. And that is what, what uh, the customer does expect from us, but therefore we need now uh, governments, we need support here to define their way not only in legislation, when you have legislation and you allow everything, you allow hybrids, fossils, whatever, but you have to make your mind as well as government. When you want to be carbon free in 2050 or when you want to be carbon free in, 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 in 2040, you have to do something now. And uh, yeah, we see that I'm sure that the current, that our current CO2 targets we get from the European Commission will will not be stable until 2030. So the 30% will, uh, will increase, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And you see, there is a lot to do, but um, we, we need to do it together. We need input from the customer. We have to work with the government. We have uh, to, to do the transformation process within our companies, Yeah, which is painful, yes, but we have to do it. And all that comes then together and we do not have another 10 years to get prepared. And, and when I hear here, the, the colleagues, uh, you would love it when I can tell you today already, okay, next month you can buy. And the next one came with the next week when, when I can buy it and can tell you, okay, next year you will have it. So the customers, they already ask us and we, we have to deliver now. Carl, yeah. I'd like to so, come to you and ask a, a, a related question, really. Um, you have to keep delivering a service to your customers. You can't just say, well, we're going to stop buying trucks for a couple of years till we find out which way this is going. You, you have to maintain fleet. You have to keep buying. What is your current view about what you're going to be buying this year and in 2022? And at what point do you say, well, we're not going to buy any more Euro 6 because they're going to be stranded assets and we won't be able to use them? Or do you have to keep buying what's available just to keep your service levels up? And how do you decide at what point you, you stop that? We had internally, and you may imagine, major discussions. How much, first of all, if, second, how much to invest in Euro 7? Euro 6 is there. We have it. So we, you, you can improve it a little bit more in fuel efficiency here and there. But we kicked already a lot of fuel efficiency measures out of the current Euro 6 program out uh, and use that money to invest in zero emission. But we, we have it and we have customers 
and uh, we are in a competition field to bring the diesels very competitive. When it comes to Euro 7, and now we discuss in 26, 27, uh, depends on if uh, new vehicles or old vehicles. So uh, let's pick 27. You really, you really can ask you where you want to go. And we, we recently announced for all our medium duties, we will not go ahead with diesel. So we will have a partner on board, which is Cummings. And Cummings is a very, very profound diesel engine supplier. They will go ahead with diesel engines. They have a knowledge that is not that homemade as we need, maybe not that in detail efficient as we would have done it, but we will work together with them. And then we have the unions, you have a complete, a complete business transformation. You have engine plants, which you, which you have to transform. And uh, yeah, that was uh, recently announced. So, uh, and, and that are very bold decisions what we are doing here, because diesel engines, that was our business uh, since the past 50 years and it, a, a very good business. And then we have concentrate ourselves in diesel. And we said, okay, medium duty, we doing with a partner, heavy duty, core business. Most of our uh, tracks, a contribution out of the heavy duty, we go, we go onwards. Cannot, we, and, and we have two because we have, uh, especially in heavy duty, a lot of countries, Mercedes, that's more than one, 180, uh, uh, Wolfgang, countries where we de, uh, deliver our uh, trucks, they will not have hydrogen and uh, and and uh, electrification and whatever within the next years. So we have to go on with diesel as well, but we have to concentrate our resources. And therefore, I said, uh, when it comes to will we have now CNG uh, CNG on the gas basis or LNG as a uh, uh, the colleagues in, in, in Italy uh, uh, prefer it. Will we go for that? Major discussions internally. We decide, no, we will not invest our money for that because there is a limited, there are limited resources, not only money-wise, but also engineer-wise. We will invest in that what we think uh, is our future and that is CO2 neutrality and gas from fossil is not CO2 neutral. It's much better in terms of CO2 than diesel, but it is not neutral. So we decided not to go there. The next question is hybrids. You can, okay, that is a good bridging because you have battery on the one hand, you have, you have on, on the other hand, you have your diesel still, but who will control later on how much diesel you will use and how much battery you will use when you're going for hybrids? how that will be then calculated in, in the vector system. Therefore, I said already, in, in the vector system, CO2 compliance, where we should not consider each and every bridging technology. Uh, we, we, we had wait far too long, and now we have to make our mind. We want to get carbon free or not. And we want to get carbon free, then let's go for it. And... Uh, Let's support it from a uh, legal side as well. Uh, uh, I, I see pretty good support, not only to us as companies, but also to the customers who want to go buy hydrogen or want to go to buy uh, uh, electric trucks. There, uh, there are subsidies uh, uh, which are interesting. So that is where we want to, we, you, we have to bring all the troops in this CO2 on this CO2 wave, and then the wave will go. But for the first step is the most complicated. But there are, your, your, your question, yes, there are both decisions to be done. We are not, have done everyone, but uh, diesel, Euro 6, especially Euro 7 told you already, uh, we already see where we will concentrate, where not, that we have our resources free to go full steam ahead for hydrogen and uh, battery electric. Great, thank you. I'd just like to finish, but it's going around the panel one at a time. I'd just like to get a feel for what, if you were sitting in front of your chairman, your chief exec next week, and he's asking you, where are we gonna go? What, what are we buying next year? Are we buying more diesels? How can you justify it? Or when do you think we're gonna start buying our first electric? So 
I'd like to ask that to you, Carl, uh, we can to first of all. What, what are you telling the Board of Directors now about where your pounds are going to be spent in the next two years? From our perspective, it's too soon. So, you know, diesel will still be around. We still need diesel. Our commercial models and our contracts are still supported by the vehicles that we operate today. You know, there's, a, there's got to be an awful lot of analysis that's done over the next two years. And I go back to the learning and experiencing piece for us to understand all the different factors that will go into influencing what we buy. Um, the fact that the technology is not there today yet and the fact that it's still being developed and the fact that actually they're not readily available at the size of vehicle that we need. So if I was to get, you know, I wouldn't be able to go and replace my fleet with electric because these guys wouldn't sell them to me in those numbers. So, yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of factors. What's really important that we all learn from each other over the next couple of years to understand how we're going to develop the vehicles further, coming, coming back to the points already made, how we're going to work together to put an infrastructure in place, whether that be lobbying with the government or working amongst ourselves to deliver that. Because as I say, it's a, it's a transition, this is a journey, and it's not going to be solved within the next two years. But going to the last point, we do need to start it now. We can't wait for 10, 20 years. We've got to start this journey now. We have to keep on doing what we can do. Otherwise, we'll never, we'll never get to where we need to in the timescales that we've got. Just a quick follow-up. A really good that. point, Carl. Sorry, go um, go. One thought is that we've we've launched our own electrification team here in the UK under a guy called Ross Patterson, who a number of you will know well, um, and he will be looking at special applications, but specifically electri electrified vehicles. And looking around um, the panel today, we've got a real diverse set of operations from parcel delivery to general haulage to bakery work to food distribution to waste disposal. And then if, if we put into that mix somebody like the Transport Association with family-owned hauliers, we'd probably have a really good spread of representation of the UK market. And I wonder if we get together a panel like this to discuss all these issues on an ongoing basis um, to provide Uwe with the intelligence that he needs within the um, R&D area and the, and the development team, but also then to learn from each other's experiences around charging technologies, hydrogen refueling technologies. So we build up this picture book that we can all use together. It might be really powerful. There you go. I think also, Sam, there's also the ability to then lobby and have good, solid conversations with government because that's yeah. what's going to be needed as well. And, and recognising that there's a number of obviously projects out there which are looking to, to build on some of these things, but actually it might need a wider audience to maybe travel faster than what we're doing at the moment. Uh, Tony, I'd like to come to you at Hovis. I mean, I'm just asking Carl, when do you think, you know, looking forward with the next year or two, when do you think, you know, the money will start going into this? And also, do you feel that the ownership structure, of, the ownership uh, structure of these vehicles is going to have to change, that you're no longer going to buy a vehicle, run it, maintain it? You're going to be buying a whole package, um, perhaps in, even including the charging infrastructure. Is that how you see it going? Or do you see the conventional model of ownership working for these new type of vehicles? That's a really it's a good question, Steve, but it's really complex to answer simply because we don't know what the vehicles are really going to look like no. in three, four, five years' time. And we won't know the amount of investment we need to lay out in four or five years' time, let alone 10 years' time. So um, to answer one part of your question, if I went to my, my CEO today, for me, it's really simple. We're going to continue to buy the best diesel vehicles available. We're going to continue to run them on HVO as a holding position. We can save, we know we can save 92% CO2 per litre with HVO. So we're, we're, we're a long way down that road of committing ourselves to saving what we need to save. We're not into research and development. You know, we're an operator. We need you guys, the manufacturers, to give us stuff that works. And they have to have, have to be viable. And you need three things to be viable. They have to work. They have to be sustainable. And they have to be cost effective. Now, without any of those three things, two of those on their own doesn't make them viable. So, as the likes of Mercedes and other manufacturers bring stuff to market that are viable, oh. Oh, Tony's gone. Uh, let, let's move on to David uh, at, uh, at DPD. Um, as I say, what, what are you going to be spending your pennies on in the next two years, do you think? And uh, are you happy, as I say, to be, you know, 
Tony just mentioned there that uh, they don't want, you don't want to be research and development for these these companies, but someone has to try them. Um, are you prepared to be a bit of a guinea pig? I, th I think with this technology and this this um, board is very much, um, you know, this panel has already sort of said, you know, we're all sort of pioneers and there's many more people who are pioneers. You know, we all believe in this technology and the way we've got to go. And to be a guinea pig, yeah, we'll be a guinea pig. But I think, you know, going back to Sam's comment, you know, of, of getting all together and, you know, in different parts of the industry is, is really important. But we also need the people who are going to be providing the fuel source for these vehicles, because sometimes we forget about that, you know, is, um, you know, I want to talk to hydrogen people. How are we going to have that infrastructure? Um, you know, vans, you know, in our market, vans is easy. You know, it's, it's an easy win. We've worked out charging systems at depot. We've worked out charging systems at, at, uh, at home, etc. We're always investing in, in better improved chargers. Um, so, so vans, you know, I honestly believe that, you know, we, we've made that big move already with the vans. You know, diesel is out in, in, our, in our world um, in, in some ways. But, you know, with, with the trucks, it's very important that, you know, we all work together. We all carry on the lobbying. All of us, you know, to want to really sort of test the vehicles in the UK market, not necessarily in Europe, because I believe our operation is slightly different to most of the Europeans. Yes, yeah, I agree. Uh, Paul, at the Aberdeenshire Council, if you were telling your, your councillors um, what's going to happen in the next two to three years, would one thing you would say, these vehicles are going to be expensive, um, costs are going to rise, is, is, is a big increase in transport cost part of your budget for the next four to five years? It will be, um, but it, it, it's not going to mean I'm going to get any more budget, unfortunately. So, yes, flag it, flagging that up, that uh, that these vehicles are more expensive will be key. Um, but so is the infrastructure that's coming to support it. And like everybody else on the call, we're providing a service, whether that's road repairs, bin collection, home carers, we're providing a service. And I see it as part of my responsibility to make sure that I'm providing vehicles that are fit for purpose. And, and unless I can do that, um, I, know, I know the comments I will be getting back from my service users at yeah. the end of the day. So, you know, certainly for the next two years, I see, apart from bringing in small quantities of electric vans, uh, which, we're, which we're able to support with the infrastructure we've got, the majority will still be diesel, the best quality diesel we can buy. And I will be using this time and putting it to the councillors, the members, the chief exec, that over the next two years, we need to plan the infrastructure and start building that infrastructure to support the large scale switch to zero emission. Yes. I believe that refuse collection is, is, is quite a good a good application for battery electrics because the, the mileage is, is tiny and they don't go very fast or very far and diesel vehicles are not very efficient. Is, is refuse collection, do you think, the next area after your smaller vehicles that you're going to be electrifying? Yes and no. <laughs> yes, you're right. We Our, our refuse vehicles, because we're a rural, semi-rural authority, we cover roughly two and a half thousand square miles. Uh, of northeast Scotland. So our refuse vehicles will average between anything from 50 to 60 kilometres a day, right the way up to 200 plus, uh, depending on the size of the route that they're covering. The configuration of the body and what's on the back of the vehicle is key to this as well. Um, so many of the manufacturers need the, the, the both sides of the chassis clear for battery storage, for hydrogen tanks, our current setup would not lend that uh, lend itself to that format. We need the near side of the vehicle kept clear because we have an additional bin lift on the side. Um, so working, working with my colleagues within the waste collection service will be looking at how they not only provide their service delivery going forward, um, so that then enables me to provide them with suitable vehicles. Um, Paul, Steve, um, at that point in time, I think I would just like to remind us at half, uh, Uwe, on a few minutes, Uwe need to leave us. Okay, yeah? great. So if we may also, let's say, give the panel 
maybe the chance to address maybe a last question to Uwe also. Uwe yes. giving the chance to address yes. or to leave us with some closing remarks. That would be yes. very nice. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Well, we've got Uwe for just uh, another few minutes. So if anyone of the operators has one particular question they'd like to put direct to him, now's your chance. I'll leave the floor open. First come, first served. Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to ask Uwe a last question. Um, as I said at the outset, we're talking about net zero carbon emissions, and I'm not entirely clear in my own mind what that really means. And I'd like to ask him what Daimler is doing about embedded carbon in the vehicles, not simply what comes out of the tailpipe, or even well-to-wheel, whatever you want to call it, but when will uh, Daimler factories be carbon neutral and the vehicle have no carbon in it when it leaves a factory? No, Sorry, yeah. I was, yeah, yeah. Now you're hearing me, right? Yes, yeah, that, that yes, is the... yeah. Embedded carbon, what, what, what's Stanley doing about taking the carbon out of the vehicle before it leaves the factory? Yeah, we have, a, we have, another, we have another program running, uh, uh, sustainability and embedded, that is not only embedded carbon, but includes uh, embedded carbon, uh, where we have a, a timeline as well where it can not give you each and every year now when, which, which uh, uh, plan, but we do have a plan there to get carbon free uh, with the embedded systems and the plants as well. And there is another program is already set up within Daimler at the company, not only for Daimler truck, um, which we follow as well. So that is not only the fuels where we're discussing here, that is uh, uh, for us really the complete picture on sustainability, which which I, I think uh, is uh, most important here as well. Yeah, it's not not only that what you get, but that, uh, how you produce uh, and uh, uh, how is your lo logistic and process chain. Great. We do that. Fantastic. Well, hey, Doctor, thank you so much indeed for your time today. We found it most interesting. Thank you for sparing the time to come and talk to us about your plans. Um, and we're sorry I had to leave us so soon, but I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. So thank you. No, th thank you very much to, to invite me to the panel here. Uh, appreciate it very much. Good discussion and uh, uh, really good, good to hear from, from all of you, uh, uh, your, your position points, uh, your, your pain points as well. Uh, but what I do here out of that panel is the clear wish together to get carbon free, to get CO neutral in a short time frame. Uh, and the question how to do, we have to answer together. That's not, not only us here, that is uh, governance, that, that there's much more to do. But uh, I, I do not know who mentioned it. Uh, there is no time to wait any longer. And therefore, uh, uh, what I presented today, uh, uh, we, uh, with COVID, without COVID, it's a day and night work. What we are doing here to get that uh, CO2 neutral, the electric cars and, and uh, hydrogen uh, uh, on the road. And uh, what, what I got out of this panel as well, everyone here is on the same page in turning this ship around. And that is a real major transformation process, not only for you guys, for us in industry, but for our governments uh, uh, as well, and for, for our environment uh, where we drive and where we live for the next, hopefully, a lot of hundreds of years. Me not, but others. So thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to you guys. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. That almost brings us to the end of our lot of time, actually. So I think on those words, it's probably a good chance to uh, wrap it up. I can't really add a lot to what. Um, Uwe just said. So it just remains me to thank Mercedes-Benz Trucks um, for hosting this webinar with us. Um, all our panelists for taking the time and your excellent contributions. Thank you very much. Couldn't have done it without you. Really appreciate your thoughts. Um, just want to repeat that the event has been recorded. Uh, there'll be a closing slide in a second telling you where you can watch it again. The slides will be available and will be sent out. Um, and there'll be an email address on the closing slide if any members of the audience have any questions they'd like to put direct to Mercedes-Benz. So thank you very much. The technology worked extremely well. I'm very grateful. You are all brilliant. Uh, so you made my job very easy. So thank you very much indeed to all our panelists and thank you for, for watching. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.